Hey, how's it going? My name is Jackie Fish and welcome to this Divide et Impera guide. So I've been wanting to make this video for a little while now um, and I've tried several ways of doing it where I kind of try and script it and edit it but I kind of just realized that isn't my type of content and I'm not very good at doing stuff like that. So what I thought I would do, the best way to kind of show you guys how to play Divide et Impera if you are a beginner is just to kind of play it and talk about it myself. So this is going to be like a 30-40 minute video of me kind of just playing out the first couple turns of a faction and just telling you guys loads of information about why I'm doing certain things. I believe this will give you guys a good foothold and stranglehold of the of Divided and Perry because I know a lot of people can find this game kind of intimidating. They don't really understand how population or supply or other features work. So by just running through these and kind of telling you guys why I'm focusing on something, I think that would be really, really useful. And I thought the best faction to start off this kind of guide video is is obviously with Rome. That's probably the faction that most people are going to play. It's a faction that you kind of get to really see a lot of these mechanics in their, in their full glory with reforms and stuff like that later on. Not that we're probably going to, you know, have to worry about them whatsoever. But as I think, I think Rome's just probably one of the, the factions that a majority of people are going to load up first. So this will be really useful. However, I think a lot of the things I'm going to suggest doing in this campaign are going to be like be able to be applied to all the other factions and you should be doing these because there's a lot of stuff like with governors and which people just don't really know about and they kind of get turned off because they load into the game and it kind of gets a bit crazy and then they just never play it again so hopefully this will be a good kind of uh, light in the shadows for you guys who are trying to load up to violet and para because i highly recommend it if you have never played this mod or you played it i definitely definitely recommend going ahead and giving this mod another go because let me tell you it is Probably the greatest mod out there, you know, for Rome 2. Well, it definitely is for Rome 2, and maybe of all time, it is, yeah, it's really, really special what they've done, and they're only continuing to work on it, so it's really good. So, the first little bit of information which you should definitely know when you're loading up to Violet and Para for the first time is that the game is balanced for normal, normal, normal game difficulty or campaign difficulty and normal battle difficulty. Even if you've played on Legendary and Warhammer or normal Rome or whatever, this game, Divided Tempera, is balanced for normal, normal. So you shouldn't be sticking up this slider. If you want a really hard challenge, you can always go on hard. And then when you're in the campaign, change the uh, battle slider back down to normal. But I wouldn't recommend going any higher unless you want to like a really, really hard experience. Maybe once you've beaten the game a handful of times and you want a bit more of a challenge. But it is always recommended to stick the game on normal, normal. Otherwise, you're going to kind of just be getting, you know, your legionary is getting defeated by basic spearmen or something along them lines just because that's not the way the game is designed so realistically with Rome you can basically pick any of these three houses and all of them have their strengths and weaknesses I'd probably for your first go stick away from play picking this one just because it gives you a moderate diplomatic penalty with all factions and diplomacy can be pretty hard in this game uh, just because you know the old total wars diplomacy wasn't really that great so that means that it's going to be much harder for you to find friends and uh, you know get allies and basically prevent everyone from just declaring war on you, which can definitely happen if you're not careful. It does obviously give you some nice bonuses, but this just isn't really worth it for a moderate diplomatic penalty. The other two I think are pretty good. This is great because it gives you the increased attacks rate. It does give you the public order penalty from Latin culture, which is obviously always going to be present throughout your empire. So you're always going to have to worry about public order a little bit more than you usual um, and the other one as well is pretty good giving you more melee attack against barbarians it's not needed but it's okay and then these two kind of cancel each other out the increased cultural conversion kind of cancels out the uh, increased public order penalty due to foreign cultures because you know obviously it converts them quicker so um, I'd probably recommend playing as these guys first just because they've got a kind of a good setup not really a lot of negatives to them um, and you can kind of push into ghoul a lot easier than maybe normally uh, and then this is kind of like the second harder one but it's still very good as well I'm going to play as these guys because um, I, I don't know I kind of think the tax rate is really good and it's going to help us show you just how you can make 
an absolute absurd amount of money from Rome and Latium, which is the province of which Rome is in, really early on in the game. I think about 10, 15, 20 turns in, you can make a crazy amount of money that will just basically fund your wars for the entire campaign. Um, and yeah, it'll basically show you guys how to work a really good economy. And this can, as I said, be applied to a lot of the other factions that have four cities in a province with a lot of resources. You can pump out and kind of squeeze every every penny from these provinces very very effectively and if you guys are um enjoying this divided impera guide if you've learned some lots some stuff that you didn't maybe know before make sure to drop a like and a comment down below it'd be really awesome if we could get this video a ton of likes to it because yeah i love divided impera and i feel like a lot of people struggle with the game and it really is simple if you just kind of follow this guide see what i'm doing and kind of go from there um, so that's yeah, we know we're Rome, whatever, whatever, whatever. So first things first, obviously in any campaign, you should realize what your diplomatic situation is. So you can just go ahead and go diplomatic. You can see that we are fighting Epirus in the south. Pyrrhus himself is landed in southern Italy, and we are also fighting the Etruscans. Lucky for me, the Etruscans only have one city here, and I think a pretty small army. So, you know, you start off in a pretty kind of difficult situation as Rome, because you've got, you know, you're being fighting two wars uh, right away, and you're kind of, you know, stuck between two pretty good armies, and, and Pyrrhus is forced is pretty scary he's got some armored elephants and uh, something we're gonna have to definitely try and take out we've got two armies garrisoned in the south of italy we've got 26 grand in the bank and then for uh, 2800 a turn which is pretty good uh, to start off and we're obviously only going to push that up so one of the most important things you should probably know as Rome is that you don't need to build a barracks. Rome itself, and by the way, if you're wondering how I got up the building manager, you just simply right click this and it will pop this up. Rome acts as a as a barracks in, uh, in Divided in Paris, so it will provide you with all the units you need. Now obviously building a barracks will provide you I think one or two more units, but you just don't need it. The first tier of Rome gives you access to Triarii, Principes and, you know, Antistati, so you're absolutely fine there, uh, nothing to worry about. So the next thing I'd probably look at in my campaign is a population. I want to know what the population is in my city so I know where I can recruit from. In Divided Tempera, every single individual city has a population, so even if Rome has 50,000 people of a certain class, it doesn't mean that Arinium up here will have the same. If I want to recruit from that 50,000 population in Rome, I'm going to have to move an army to Rome to get that. And it's very simple to see the population. You can see the population of a city by just hovering over, I believe, this one right here. So you can see in Rome we have 2,000 of the first uh, the first class, 7,000 of the second class, 39,000 of the third class, and so on. You can also see the growth as well. So that's just by simply hovering over these little people right here. Um, and I believe if you just hover over anything here, it will show you the growth of the city. So you can kind of see all the factors affecting it. At the moment, we've got a bit of a decline in Rome going down. And that's mainly down due to overcrowding. To get around overcrowding, you simply do just have to increase the province uh, capital of it. Uh, but we'll get onto stuff like that in a little bit. You know, the main focus is just to kind of realize, okay, so I've got Rome has 7,000 plebs. That's the second class, which is generally your warrior class. Over here, we have 4,000. And up here in the north, we have, you know, a uh, 5,000 plebs. So actually, a crazy amount of population in Rome to begin this campaign. And um, that's really, really good. Um, also, a good thing to note as well is by hovering over this, by seeing that we've got huge overcrowding here, like a lot of overcrowding in Rome, it also is kind of a good idea to recruit from them regions, you know? The regions that aren't necessarily growing, recruit from them, because if you bring men away, that will kind of balance out the negative modifiers you're getting from overcrowding, and that'll be really useful. But yeah, again, population is not a huge thing right now, but it's good to be aware of it in the early game. So first things first, obviously we need some armies. Uh, we're fighting plenty of wars. Uh, we have a handful of generals, and generally these generals are pretty good to start off. This guy has some uh, really good bonuses. Yeah, this guy's actually amazing. It's always good to check your bonuses of your generals. I know these stats can look a bit, bit overwhelming, but mainly just kind of look for the important ones, the melee attack, the upkeep, and also the morale as well. So this guy is really, really good. He has a, a ton of amazing stats, so I'm going to use this guy as a commander. So we'll, we'll bring him to Rome because obviously Rome is where we have the heavy population, and I'm going to recruit some men. 
Um, so right here, you can see what class your population come from. And it's normally quite easy to tell, even if you don't know off the top of your head, because generally it will kind of go in descending order. Your first class will have the least amount of population. Your second will have the next least. And then your third will have the most. That's just kind of how it works. Um, so you can kind of tell, you know, oh, plebs, I have 7,000 of them. They, that's probably my second class. The Patriarchy, I have 2,400. That's probably my that class and, and so on. You know, you can see. So generally what I like to do in the game, I mean, for Rome, it's kind of a bit easier because I know for a fact that I have a lot of population and a lot of overcrowding here. So I can actually afford just to grab up a bunch of Astarte. And I mean, Rome is just disgusting. You can recruit six units from Rome right off the bat. It's just really good. So we're going to grab up some Astarte. They're actually really good in the early game. Um, and the Principes just kind of aren't worth the extra 40 gold. They give you some more armor and they give you some more base morale. But... Again, in the early game, we're mainly just going to be dominating Aretium and then moving to the south. Um, so that's absolutely fine. And this is where I'm going to be recruiting the majority of my men from. Uh, we can also recruit some mercenaries if we wanted to as well. Uh, so that's really important as well. We have an army down here to the south, and the thing is, I'm going to recruit some men down here, but I'm not going to recruit anyone good. I'm just going to grab up some men, and again, these guys are literally the same unit, so it doesn't really matter. Let's just grab up some guys here. Um, so I'm going to recruit some men down here to the south, basically just to try and scare Pyrrhus off. Because he has an army in Taurus, and I don't want him to come over. So we'll recruit an army here, and that'll be uh, really useful. The next thing I want to do as Rome is I want to probably start installing some governors. And you may think, what the hell are you talking about, Jackie? This game doesn't have governors. That's a tiller you're thinking of. Well, in Divide et Impera, generals who don't have an army, so they're not attached to an army. So, for example, I'll just show you. So, I guess it'll be good to probably stick one here for... Yeah, we'll stick one down here to the south for now. Um, so, yeah. So, basically, we'll look for a good commander uh, or someone who has a lot of good beneficial, beneficial traits for a city. So, someone like this who reduces order, public order penalties due to foreign culture and gives minus one empire maintenance. Um, does this guy give anything? Again, we just kind of have to look. So, he gives plus 11 tax rate which is really, really good. Uh, we're looking for someone, though, who does, if we have, improved commerce. This guy gives us 16% tax rate, you can see at the top, and two research and more loyalty as well, which is really useful. This guy is actually goddamn amazing. Wow. Rome rolls some amazing generals, and he also gives public order. So we're probably going to pick up this guy to start off with, and we're going to recruit him, and we're just going to stick him in the city. So now that he's in the city, he's going to slowly gain experience every single turn whilst he's not with an army. If I was to suddenly recruit, you know, a ton of infantry with him, he would stop getting this experience gain every single turn. So, you know, I basically want him just to sit in the city and act as a governor. Um, and as he will level up, we'll be able to see it when he does finally level up. I'll be able to then provide him with stuff to help stimulate the economy, improve public order, reduce my empire maintenance and also give me a ridiculous amount of research. So I highly recommend you do this as soon as you have a good enough economy to stand a couple armies, um, and maybe even just like if you're not under a lot of pressure, maybe you know, you're only fighting Epirus and you have two full stacks, start doing this and you want to kind of do this in the majority of your um, popular cities. So the cities that will give you a lot of money. Because obviously in Divided Tempera and in Total War in general, you have to kind of worry about this Imperium level. I can only have four armies. So by having a general right here, that's taking away from one of my armies. So you have to kind of try and balance it. But you definitely want to try and get these guys up and running as early as you can afford it. I mean, because obviously they're going to cost you 285 gold. But as they level up, they will 100% pay for themselves. So I recommend as Rome doing this as early as possible um, and just kind of going from there. So next, now that we've kind of installed a governor, um, or I call this a governor. These are also governors. They're statesmen for everyone else. But um, Rome is very lucky if they start off with one of these guys. Get this guy up as soon as possible in your campaigns. You can find them by researching, I think it's this one right here. Yeah, dignitaries is what they're called, right? Yeah. So I would always rush this tech as quickly as possible because I believe you can get two of them. Uh, yeah, and it's so important to get them because what you can do is you can deploy them in the region and they will again just level up and they can give you some crazy good bonuses. Uh, right now, he's already giving me plus four tax rate to the region. He's giving me minus one empire maintenance, one culture, one growth, one public order. 
Um, so you want to get these guys leveling up as quickly as possible because once again, if you combine this with a general and then what you can do as well, this is, I, we'll get onto that in a little bit because you don't want to do that in your first turn. Um, but you can also add like fleet generals on. Um, so yeah, just, you know, this is really, really important to have a general here who will level up over time and you can provide him with some crazy bonuses. So we've done our armies. We're recruiting our men to obviously go fight Epirus and kill them pretty quickly. What we can do is we can move our spy up here so we get a better idea. Um, again, something the spies are really useful for. I can steal some food from this. So not only will he have less food, but I'll also gain some food as well. Uh, so it's really useful to deploy spies to regions and it also gives them a little bit more vision. So the next thing I probably want to do is diplomacy. So as you can see, uh, you're given you're giving I think 26,000 gold at the beginning of the game, uh, and you this is kind of with the impression that you're going to spend this money on making friends in the world. You're not supposed to spend all this money on buildings and armies and stuff. You can do, but if the goal of it is to spend this stuff on making friends in the greater world you know i'm very good friends of carthage if i want to push that that'd be great because uh, diplomacy is hard at the beginning of the game you know luckily uh Masalia and factions like this love me so we can probably actually just squeeze some money out of them uh, maybe get a non-aggression as well um to help us and get you know, get some friends in the world luckily with Masalia, we don't have to really worry about that they're not going to accept that but that's fine we can just get some money do not need your goods to from them the and an non-aggression as well uh, and that should be fine so we got some money we got non-aggression and we also got trade which is really useful something to keep in mind though is that when you're doing diplomacy in divide et impera you have to be very cautious about who the, pe the, the person you're making diplomatic treaties with who are their enemies so for example uh, I'm really good friends of Carthage at the beginning of this because we're both fighting Pyrrhus. We don't want Pyrrhus to, you know, dominate this area in the Mediterranean and get stronger. However, if I was to suddenly make peace with Pyrrhus, Carthage would really, really dislike that. And I'd get big you know, negative modifiers with them. And all of a sudden, you know, Carthage wouldn't be my friend. All of a sudden, they would slowly start to break non-aggressions, break trade, and then that would inevitably lead to war. So you have to be very cautious with diplomacy and divided impera because it's kind of like a, a scale. And when one side starts to tip, it collapses and completely breaks. So, yeah, as I said, it's a good idea to, uh, yeah, just keep that in mind, you know. See who someone's at war with, and if you want to be friends with the person they're at war with, uh, keep a close eye on it. When you capture people uh, after a battle, if you set them free and someone else, one of your allies is also at war with them, they'll dislike that. So it's just small things like that. The Po Valley, um, again, we want to probably try and keep friends with like Ligeria and other people in the north. I don't really want to have to fight them. So as you can see, just a little bit of money turns them into non-aggressions. Um, they don't even join my war. I don't want them to because we're about to kill them. But you can see like a little bit of money goes a long way in this. So we're just going to go bang, bang. Give them that much money. Uh, and that secures non-aggressions. And non-aggressions are very important in this game. It kind of acts as um, an actual non-aggression should. Uh, you definitely notice it. You know, if you have an aggression with a faction, they're not going to declare war on you. Uh, it does seem like Veniti... Look at friends with me, but I can't have them coming in. So we're just going to spend the money. You know, it might it might seem crazy, right, that we're doing this. But trust me when I say it. You know, these non-aggressions do come up big and, and really, really help. You know, generally what a faction will do is it will break its non-aggression uh, first with you uh, before declaring war. I don't really want to spend five grand. Five grand's a bit too much with Syracuse. And they might, like, either Carthage are going to kill them or they'll declare war and I'll kill them. So... You know, it's not too crazy. So, you know, we've done our diplomacy. We've done our recruitment. We've put down a governor to slowly start to level up in Ascalon. And we'll end up moving him to Rome eventually. But obviously right now I've got an army inside. Um, our public order we've seen is, is okay in these regions. It's not amazing, but it's not the worst in the world. You can see the cultural differences and slaves causing us some issues. Um, down here in the south, we've got a few issues. So now we want to probably look at our economy. Um, and you know, straight off the bat, you can see how crazy Italy or Italia or, or Latium, I think it's called. Yeah, Latium is. It has Rome, which is obviously an amazing city. Uh, it has three other cities, all with resources. We have wine. I believe this is salt and fish. 
And that's going to give us some crazy... And there, there's two coastal towns as well, which will have harbours in as well. So they'll just give you a crazy amount of gold through commerce. And that's basically what you want to do. If you see a province like this, even if it only has like three... If basically, any province with uh, three or maybe even two or more of these goods, you want to just focus it on commerce because it's the easiest way to make a buttload of money. So right off the bat, building an amphitheater isn't a bad idea in Rome. It will give you a ton of happiness and it's not really something you have to kind of worry about for a while when you have these amphitheaters. The amphitheaters or the... I can't remember what the other ones are called. Are generally better for the other factions though. Because they give a big boost to your fur or your second class population. Which is normally the, your warrior class you want to boost that. But with Rome it only gives it to a 0.5% to the class of the citizens. So it's not like really that great. What you can do is you can just build it and then transform it later on. Is always a good idea. I'm going to stick it uh, some... I'm probably going to build right off the bat just simply this right here. Because this goes ahead and gives you a little bit of boost to your second class, which is your warrior class and your population. And also uh, gives you some commerce as well, which again is really important. Uh, probably not going to want to upgrade Rome quite yet. We will soon, but not immediately. Um, the next thing we want to probably do is start getting some of these resources flourishing as quickly as possible. Uh, the first one we're probably going to do is this one right here because obviously uh, it's fish and it's away from the Etruscans. The Etruscans are probably going to take their army and go here. So we're going to have to stop them and take their city if we can help it. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and spend our growth points that we have, upgrade the city, and then we're immediately going to grab these fishing boats because that's going to give us fish. And then we're going to go down the route that gives us more commerce. It will give us less money for trade, but it will allow us just to boost our commerce. And as I said, that's what we want to do. We also actually do have more growth in Rome, which is just absolutely crazy. I guess we will probably grow Rome itself. Um, and it's only three to upgrade it. Oh, wow. It's only one to upgrade these. That's crazy. Okay. Well, you definitely want to boost both of these because then you can finally upgrade Rome as well. Um, probably going to save our money a little bit. Um, because then that's amazing now that we have both. I didn't realize Rome had that many growth points at the beginning. And then down here in Beneventium, we probably, again, it's only one to upgrade. That's crazy. Probably going to just build some food down here in Beneventium. Um, because as you start to upgrade these cities uh, up, it really starts to drain on your food. As well as that, these, as you upgrade these, also start to give you big public order penalties and stuff. So you're going to have to try and deal with that. But that's not really very important right now. We'll just build some food in Beneventium. Do we want to build some food in Beneventium? Probably want to build food down here. Um, so screw it. Let's go really greedy. I probably recommend maybe building like um, Yeah, maybe building some food or a temple here, but let's just go greedy for the purpose of like Actually not this is a tutorial. Let's say I would probably build if I was playing like super safe for my first time I'd probably build you know consecrated ground because it will provide us it's, it's fairly cheap and it will also provide us with some public order, some sanitation, and also uh, some culture. And culture is actually a little bit of an issue down here in Latium because obviously you have the Greeks coming in. So getting that sorted early on is just really important because then you can always just delete these buildings and that's everything. Uh, yeah, I mean, you just kind of go from there. So I think that's uh, basically our first turn done. We've done our diplomacy. We've done our, our recruitment. Uh, we've got our spies and agents down, we've built our buildings, and we do still have some growth, but we don't want to spend, like, we don't want to go rushing off and just spend everything we have, because mercenaries and other stuff like that is really important. We could recruit a general here, uh, we definitely could, uh, if we wanted to. And honestly, that's maybe not a bad idea. We still have a little bit of money, and these guys are fairly cheap, only 700. So do we have anyone who was completely crazy good? I mean, these are all not bad. Um, and he does give us 11%. He's probably a better, yeah, he's probably a better governor. So you'll, you'll definitely notice if you just track these, like some, some generals are just a lot better at being a governor than they are anything else. And that's because, so the reason we can see that he's got a ton of traits and these guys don't is because these guys come from, if I go to the characters, these guys come from my houses. I've already recruited them. So they actually have like all these traits done. So they actually have like, um, 
They already have their personality traits, which was the word I was looking for. So you can see that they kind of already have these that all add so much to it. Whereas the guys who I have to actually buy uh, don't have them traits yet. So they will get a personality trait uh, or personality traits once I recruit them. So let's roll the dice. This guy's pretty good. He also helps out with public order due to foreign culture. And we only have 50% Latium here. So screw it. Let's roll the dice with this guy. Hopefully he'll be pretty good for governorship. Um, and if we hover over this stat right here... Uh, yeah, he's not bad. Uh, he actually gives a lot of public order, which is good in the early game. And he's also okay for military, so we can always give him some stuff for the military. Uh, you know, I can always give him an army later on and just level him up here, because I can just level him up and then give him an army later on. He doesn't necessarily have to be a governor, just because he's kind of acting as a governor right now. So cool, let's end the turn. Let's jump onto the next turn, and we'll see how kind of everything we've done starts to develop. Okay, so turn two has just started. You can probably see if we go and take a look at these generals. Um, oh, they haven't actually... Oh, sorry, that's the army. So you can see they have now just got a bit of experience. They gain two experience every single turn, and that starts to add up, you know. In four or five turns, they'll get a level up, and we can start to upgrade them, and they'll only go from there. As well as that, we've got a bunch of these household stuff as well, which is really useful. So unfortunately, this guy got the, uh, the dude right now, and we just don't need that. Um, also, we just don't need this either. As you win battles, you'll get a lot more of these, and they'll be very useful, especially on your governors. You can get some stuff which, again, just absolutely ramps up commerce and gives you so much money so it's always good to keep a close eye on this and as we win more battles we will uh yeah get ready to move in so what we could do is we could push into enemy territory right away there's no point uh you know even though it is winter next turn their army is still there recruiting we can now spend our time recruiting and as you can see, all of a sudden, we've taken a large amount of our plebs out of the system. We had like 7,500 plebs. Now we only have 6,000. Don't get me wrong, 7,000 or 6,000 is still a lot of your warrior class. You can recruit a lot of good units like that. However, it works as a percentage. So the way population works in Divided Impera is everything is a percentage. So for example, if you have a, you know, if you have... Um, if you're growing your pleb population by 1% every single turn, then, you know, it's a huge difference if it's a 1% increase on 100 or 1% increase on 6,000. So you can see, if you suddenly just go ahead and drain this right away, beginning of the game, you're like, yeah, screw it, we want as many plebs as possible. If you end up doing that, uh, you're going to be left with a really kind of hard road to recovery. So you want to kind of try and spread out your recruitment and you want to utilize weaker units in the early game. You want to recruit, you know, units like this um, that come from the third class uh, so that your second and first class can really flourish as you get towards the mid to late game when you actually need them quality units because you're fighting bigger empires. So I do highly recommend, you know, especially as Rome, you can recruit plebs and you can recruit, you know, decent soldiers like Principe and Astarte. But try and have, you know, a handful of these weaker units in just to help out a population because replenishment comes off a of population. When you replenish an army in a region, it will take from that population. So, you know, even if I have six, if I come back to Rome, my army's very depleted. It will take another, you know, 2,000 men. If they say, say all of these guys were on 10 men and they were replenishing in Rome. It would then take the extra, you know, 2,000 men or whatever. Yeah, it'll take, you know, however many men I need to replenish that from my population pool. Then all of a sudden, that 1% um, growth on the pleb class of 6,000 is now 1% from 4,000, you know, so instead of getting 60 plebs a turn, I'm now getting 40, and so on and so on, you know, say then I, I go on a recruitment drive and I recruit more, all of a sudden that pleb number is really low, and I'm not getting a high percentage. You can do stuff to improve that, so by recruit, like, using certain buildings, um, upgrading, obviously, your main building increases the population growth of one, like, basically all classes by an extra 0.4%. Um, and there's a lot of buildings that do, you know, you can see this building increases my second class citizen population growth by 0.3, and so on, you know. So there's a lot of stuff with population you can do. It's just good to keep in mind that that is a percentage, and if you don't need to draw from your higher classes, don't. And we don't as Rome. We can get away with not doing it, and we're absolutely fine. Something I do want to do, though, and I probably should have done... Oh, we don't have any more slots. I was going to say, maybe sending my spy down to the south would have been a better idea. Uh, you can obviously see, due to trade and stuff, the uh, you know where Pyrrhus is, what Pyrrhus is doing, and you can see he's currently on boats right now, so it's great to keep a close eye on that. 
all our soldiers have been recruited, which is really useful. Um, and we basically just don't want to fight Pyrrhus right away. We want to deal with the Etruscans in the north immediately and then go elsewhere. But for now, everything is just building. Uh, there's not really a lot you can do. I do recommend getting your wife married, uh, your, sorry, your, you know, your leader married as soon, because that does give you some really good bonuses in this. Um, and you want to try and get to like, uh, up there but again this isn't something you really have to worry about basically the more influence you get um from your generals the higher you got the more control your party gets um but for the most part you know pol politics isn't something you really have to worry about too much in the early game but it is obviously very useful just to keep a close eye on this see what people like see what people don't like um and kind of just go from there you know you can just hover over these and be like oh yeah but this is basically very similar to the way vanilla works. So I don't think I really have to go over this. You know, it's just kind of the same. Uh, I'd always keep a close eye on that, but nothing too crazy. It's also very important as well to see how much cunning you have. Because a really good way in the early game of making a little bit extra cat, a little bit of extra cash is by embezzling funds. Now you need a character in your faction that has six more cunning. Uh, or six cunning in incomplete and then you take you, you go ahead and give minus loyalty to other factions but as you can see we can quite easily sustain that because everyone loves us right now and then you get like two thousand gold and that kind of kind of add up you know as you, you grow so it's always a good idea to see oh you know this person uh this will give them two extra cunning okay cool well it's, it's good to keep an eye on it i would say um, so now you can see that our household uh, stuff has been pretty useful and we've got that goose back from that guy. So I'm going to go ahead and stick over the goose over onto this guy because it will give plus two public order to the local province, which is obviously all of these cities. And right now, uh, Italia is the region that is kind of struggling the most of public order and that will actually sort out our public order issues right away. Um, and again, something to keep into mind is we're playing the faction that is uh has the negative to public order you can see you can already see we're kind of already getting a grip of our public order which is pretty important you know with our governor working away slowly leveling up and and other stuff as well so next time we're going to go beat the etruscans and move on from there we're still stealing food even though it's winter i think we can still get stuck in um so yeah something else as well which is really important to keep an eye on um so now that we've built up this army um we're actually providing a negative public order bonus because this is an army garrisoned in a city yeah we're providing negative public order to the city itself uh, it's only one right now but if you have a full 20 stack it can really add up and i think it has a multiplier with other other things happening around the city as well so you know if i want to try and reduce this um oh no it's actually oh my god it's huge sorry i didn't realize that was a seven not a two i thought that was a two from over here um so you can see, just having this army with eight units in, inside a city, is providing me a minus six uh, public order penalty. So you want to generally leave your armies outside of cities, unless they're like this. You can see that this guy um, isn't giving any negatives to public order or anything, because he's just one army. I think if you have over two units in an army, it will then start to accumulate minus public order. So you want your actual armies outside of the cities. And another thing you can do with the stances, if you really want to go, is to sit in patrol stance uh, right here. So it's this one right there. That'll give you some more public order, plus four public order. However, if the army gets attacked, it will then go ahead and uh, make it so it got ambushed. So you only want to do this with armies that are, there's no chance in hell that they will be attacked. You want these you want these armies to be on patrol if they're in a region that is just you know completely safe locked down there's gonna be no surprise attack coming out of fog of war because if they get attacked they're gonna be ambushed and they're probably going to die so you want to provide them you know kind of just sit them back i know that pyrrhus is over here so it, and i don't think he could march all this way anyway and i'm also protected by the city as well so you know i can stick him in patrol stance or then make the city start to become happy which is really good because it gives the plus four public order um, and it also makes, you can see our economy as well, it goes in and, and saves us a little bit of money as well, which is nice. So, you know, just by a, a few things of putting our army outside the city, going on patrol stance with a safe army, um, all of a sudden, you know, this region of Italia is now happy without any buildings actually being completed. Um, now again, we don't have any money to really spend on buildings, so we're just going to leave our growth slots, you know, growth doesn't go away, this will always be here and it will only get more and more. Um, so we can just we can just chill with this growth. We're in no rush to upgrade these buildings until we've we've kind of secured Italy and Latium. So again, just another end term. 
that we can do. There's no real need for diplomacy right now. We're kind of just, you know, waiting for our army to be recruited so that we can attack Aretium and move on. It's also a pretty good idea as well to keep some growth points behind because you're going to want to upgrade Aretium if you can as quickly as possible because uh, that provides you with wine and I think wine gives you the most money out of the salt, fish and wine that you have through commerce. So yeah, what we'll do is we'll just let the turn play out and then we'll come back uh, when we're ready to move in to kill the Epirus. Oh, we actually already done it, that's fine. It's also a very good idea to see what's going on around the world. So the Veneti are at war with the Illyrian tribes right here. And this is important, right? Because we put our money, we've got a non-aggression with the Veneti. And that means that these guys are not going to be as friendly to us because we've made packs with uh, with uh, Batavium and the Veneti. So we're going to have to keep an eye on that. And say, for example, that this faction wins out in this war, all of a sudden they don't like me because of my friendship with the Veneti and now they're bordering me. So it's just like stuff like that you have to keep a close eye on. So our army is now fully done. We can push in. It does seem like they've actually recruited outside the city, which is very good for us. We can exploit this. So I'm going to just go ahead and recruit some mercenaries. Um, this is something you don't necessarily have to do, but I want to move in and I just want a quick war um, so that I can push down south as quickly as possible. So we're going to move in. We're going to engage them. We could fight this battle. We're not going to. We're just going to auto-resolve it. You can see we can take heavy casualties. Um, and being aggressive gives us the most men back, remaining forces, but I think protective. Um, no, we'll just go aggressive. It gives us a Pyrrhus victory. Uh, being aggressive means we're more likely to lose units. Um, and the, like, the damage is going to specifically go on a handful of units. Uh, but that's fine. So we're going to do that. So now the question is, what do we do with the Etruscan prisoners? We could release them, we could enslave them, um, or we could kill them. Releasing them gives us the most money, and it also means that people who like the Etruscans are going to get positive relations with us. Enslaving them kind of just gives us a little bit of money, but doesn't give us negative or positive stuff with the Etruscans or anyone who is friends with them or against them. And killing them gives us bonuses to diplomacy uh, with uh, people who don't like the Etruscans, so who are generally at war with them. And this is something you probably want to do if uh, if you've got a bunch of allies fighting in a war with you against a certain person, is you generally just want to probably kill them. We're simply probably just going to release them because slaves are very good. Uh, so by clicking the enslavement option, you get a bit of money now, and then your slave population goes up in your, in your surrounding cities, which then generates more money. In the early game, though, I don't think it's necessarily worth it just because you generally uh, can't kind of counter the public order issues as effectively and it's just not necessary there'll be plenty of slaves to get as you go and expand your empire so i'm just going to release them um, because no one else is at war with the etruscans i don't think um so we can just do that and then we'll just take the city it'll be fairly easy because we already fought the army outside the city uh, a pretty easy uh, objective to take so now we have a few options we can occupy the city loot subjugate uh, sack the city raise or liberate it we're just going to occupy it. The other options are we could loot and occupy it, which is this. However, by looting and occupying the city, you would severely damage the infrastructure of the city and you would kill a lot of that population. Uh, when you take a city, the pop... Okay, well, actually, I'll show you guys in a second. So just know that, that like, by looting, you'll be killing a lot of the population. Obviously, sacking, you don't take it and you kill a lot of the population and raising the city, you, like, just raise it to the ground, basically. So by occupying it, we'll get the, the least amount of public order penalties um, in the city. We'll get this one turn of like unhappiness uh, and then that will go away, which is, you know, which is good for us. Um, as well as that, you know, it'll be, you know, really very beneficial. So um, because we had, I think, I think so. Yeah, so this is how so this is how the population is going to work. So because we just took this region, we can take a look at the population, and you can see there is an absolute huge amount from the third class. Um, so when you take a region, I think it's if you have 50% more culture, which you can see your culture here in the province, which we do, it was 61%. Only half of the population turns to foreigners. Um, however, if you're conquering a region, so if, say for example, I was to conquer Genoa, which is like, you know, 90% barbarian or whatever their religion is, uh, Golic, or I don't even know what they are in the Po Valley, um, 
you know, everyone would just go to foreigners. So that means you can't just recruit men and replenish your armies immediately when you're taking cities. So you have to be very, very careful with your expansion. Luckily for me, you know, this is already very Roman anyway, so we could just move in and our army will replenish pretty nicely here. But say, for example, I was to take Genoa, um, all of a sudden, you know, that I wouldn't be able to effectively replenish my army because the majority of the population would turn from wherever they are currently which would probably be the, you know, the Genoan equivalent of, you know, plebs, you know, patrici and whatever. They would all go to the third and fourth class because they're not Roman citizens. We're conquering them. So you have to keep that in mind when you're expanding into territory that isn't your culture, that all of a sudden you might find yourself not being able to replenish your armies. Um, again, that's not something we have to really worry about right now. So we can kind of just go from that. You can also see that we do have a barracks here. The only bonus by recruiting these barracks is recruiting these guys, and we just don't need them. Like, you know, they have a, a few decent stats here and there, but, the you know, the Principes will do its job for the foreseeable future. Um, yeah, by moving our army outside the city, we saved, what, 10, you know, 12, 8 public order. So we'll do that. Um, this army can't patrol because it just fought. But he did level up, which is great. So all of a sudden, you can start to see uh, some really good bonuses coming in. One of the bonuses I highly recommend you grab up in the Divided Imperial Tree immediately is this one right here. So Proven Leader, Commander of Men even, and then grabbing up Proven Leader. On all your military guys, I recommend grabbing this because it gives you 12% campaign movement range, which is just insane. And also gives you some really good morale as well. So I always recommend grabbing this up for all of your military generals. You can also see some of the commerce ones. I don't think we're a little bit far away from these guys upgrading. Um, yeah, it's going to be a handful of turns till these guys level up. But you can actually see from this tree right now some of the amazing bonuses you can get. So this is a really important one to pick up as quickly as possible. The boost to uh, to sail, uh, doing sales, giving you great bonuses to the edict of local commerce. Um, you can also see you get some huge public order bonuses and tax bonuses from this general upgrade. Uh, amazing, amazing research speed right here and also some food stuff. So this is kind of the tree you want to go down. But again, we'll get to that when our generals do level up or our governors do level up. So again, we'll just take our point in proven commander so we get the extra campaign movement range and also a little bit more morale when fighting in foreign territory is always super useful. Our spy can now just head down south. Uh, we can see where Pyrrhus actually is now and get a little bit more vision. It's always great to do this. You could always move your governor down there and start stealing money from Taris, but and just to basically give you vision until your spy's up here. But I think just, you know, applying this to the city as quickly as possible is great. So let's destroy this barracks. We just don't need it. It's kind of a waste. Um, and we'll, we'll wait. Um, again, we'll wait for our growth. We don't really have a lot of money right now. Uh, so we will just chill out and, and we'll be fine. We'll, we'll maybe... Do we want to recruit some men here? We could pick up some cavalry, but we don't really have the population. But again, Eretium isn't a region I'm going to really be recruiting from like ever. But no, it's probably better if we just wait. Uh, and we're saving money as well. Units are expensive to recruit in this game. So we're just going to save our money and, you know, make our way down south. Uh, right now, I'll see. So yeah, this is actually also a trade-off. Uh, by being in this city, I actually get more replenish replenishment right now um, than if I was to stand outside of the city. But I'm taking a public order penalty. I think at this current point, it's better to have this army inside the city uh, than not. Because I need the extra replenishment. I need to get down to the south as quickly as possible and deal with that. Um, as you can see, you know, public order and uh, diplomacy is looking pretty good across the board. Uh, there's probably a few more people I could trade with if I wanted to. Like, And again, as I said, you guys could probably work out a lot more of this trade stuff like a lot quicker um, than, than I could. It does seem like I'm not going to be friends with, the, with these guys. So I might as well, you know, try and be, be a bit more friendly with people around them. Um, basically, just work your diplomacy like that, you know. We will gladly listen to your again, I'm not really going to be looking to do this with, uh, you know, again, like this is going to make these guys really not like me because of all my treaties with them. Yeah, minus 19. That's a lot. Um, so, yeah, we're going to have to obviously, you know, be a bit cautious of that. Syracuse just doesn't like us, I think, because we're very, yeah, we're fighting Epirus, which is their friend. And also our friendship with Carthage as well. Um, but they, they could trade with us as well. You know, if you can get trade, that's really good. Trade seems to generally be... Um, oh, we can do an edict now as well. That's great. 
Um, trade seems to be like a, a scale, as I said previously, whereas like as soon as you start getting a bunch of tradable resources, everyone wants to trade with you and everyone wants to pay you for trade. Um, but when you don't have many resources, no one wants to have anything to do with you. Uh, so it's always good to try and grab up these resources as quickly as possible. And as you can see, we're going to. We're going to have two salt and also uh, our fishing done very soon. And then we're going to also build some wine as well uh, pretty soon. And again, that's going to give us so much money. Uh, very very quickly so edict wise probably the most important ones to do uh tax harvest is pretty good bread and games if you're trying to um if you're trying to just make the city happy and you have enough food to kind of give away uh, romanization is also really good because it gives you culture conversion building costs down and also recruitment of uh auxiliaries and stuff it's actually a very very useful one to grab up when you're expanding and you want to kind of convert and then move on to somewhere else the one that you're probably going to be using the most is commercial stimulus though because uh, it gives you 20% wealth from all commerce buildings and also more slaves which again help with commerce and, and stuff like that. So uh, we're going to pick up commercial stimulus. It's a little bit early for us like maybe just picking up tax harvest or uh, breading games is probably just better but you know whatever for the purpose of this video you can really see the bonuses uh, of that. Um, especially, you know, once we're getting 120 gold from that, we're getting 180 gold from this. Obviously, it will change the commerce once we upgrade it. Uh, you know, that will start giving us 375 gold from commerce, uh, plus the 20% from these bonuses, and then all the other generals is going to be absolutely crazy, trust me. So let's end the turn again. Uh, we can probably just, you know, spam through a handful of these turns uh, until a few of our generals level up and we move our army down to the south. So we're simply just on the next turn, um, and something I guess is, which is pretty kind of important to, to kind of think about when you're moving your armies, is that this army is still replenishing. It replenished pretty nicely from being in this region. Um, but it's like, I want to start moving this army down south, but if I move this army down south, it's going to start replenishing from Rome, and do I really want the, the men to come from Rome, uh, which will then diminish Rome's population itself, rather than Eretium, you know, Rome is always going to be my stronghold, and as you can see, we're only making 12 people from Rome every single turn, we've actually got negative growth across the board, every, yeah, across the entire region. So it's very important to, you know, just keep a close eye on this, you know. If I drag off a load of men from Rome, I'm going to be getting a lot less soldiers in general. So now that's built, we want to go ahead and pick up that vin uh, yeah, that, that vinery uh, as soon as possible. Because again, it gives us money from culture or from agriculture. And then when we start going down this route, it'll give us money from commerce. And we want to just focus commerce as much as physically possible. So Rome's back here. I probably, again, want to avoid recruiting men from here if I can help it. Um, but an extra couple men probably wouldn't like maybe some slingers again these guys come from a lower class So just grabbing a handful of these guys is pretty important also these horses mm, Now horses are fine to keep in the army actually the mercenary unit we picked up the thing is like mercenaries are extremely expensive to buy But they're very you know, they're, they're basically normal price to do upkeep So you can if you have the money you can spam mercenaries and then there's no reason to get rid of them unless they're like crazy good and expensive um, but yeah, I can keep this unit of horse in there. We'll pick up some of these guys because they're from the lower class and we don't have to, we don't, we don't really care about that class too much. Our governor leveled up and this is a good thing to keep, kind of keep an eye on. So the one you want to go for right away in Rome is going to be this green tree because it provides you, is it this one? It's this one right here that gives you more uh, percentage from commerce and also improves the commercial stimulus edict. So we're going to go down that route and then on the next level up, we can stick some points in the commercial stimulus one, which will then improve this, which is really good. So let's move our spy down into the Taras. Uh, we can see that Pyrrhus is down there recruiting with his scary ass elephants um, and some cool units as well. Greek slingers. That's very cool. But we know that we can keep this army in patrol stance. This region's going to become very happy once the, uh, the consecrated ground is built and we start boosting our culture. Rome isn't as happy, but again, that's not something we have to worry about too much. Something to keep a close eye on is down here on the left, you have province effects. Um, and it's, it's kind of pretty useful to just check up on these now and again. You can see that we have indifferent people. So as your people get happier and unhappier, they'll provide different bonuses. I think the threshold is like 20 public order either way and then 80 public order either way. If they really like you, if you have plus 80 public order, you'll get huge bonuses to growth and tax rate. And then vice versa, if they really dislike you, you'll get huge negatives to your tax. So it's always a good idea to try and get that public order up as quickly as possible when you can. Because they provide you good tax bonuses and growth. And growth is really important 
as it's extremely slow in Delilah Tempera, and getting it higher is just, you know, good as, as quickly as you can. And a great way of doing that is to low your ta lower your taxes, because not only does it give you less, uh, less public order penalties, it also gives you more growth, and more growth equals more population. Um, so actually by lowering your taxes, you'll see these negatives going down. Um, you know, the lower your taxes are in certain regions, the more pull it has for immigration and people to be, you know, come into the, the separate classes. So if you can, if you have a good economy going, it's always a good idea to be on lowest taxes because it just provides you the least amount of public order negatives, gives you the most growth and um, also provides you with a very nice boost to population growth as well. So that's another way if you're really struggling to get your population up is just lower your taxes. You'll see a big influx of people coming in and obviously it will only snowball because the more population growth you have, the more people you get coming in, the better that percentage will be on each individual class. So it's kind of like a big snowball effect. So another quick tip just now as I'm ending the turns and kind of just waiting for our army to be fully replenished so we can march against Epirus um, is that winter provides some pretty nasty negatives. You can see right here, uh, you can see the province effects of every single uh, every single season. Um, as you can see, you know, this is just a normal winter. You can get much worse winters in Gaul and the Alps and stuff like that. Uh, but just a basic winter is providing minus 30 campaign movement range, public order penalties, wealth from agriculture, growth negatives, and replenishment rate. So generally, you don't want to be moving around in winter. And it makes sense, right? You want to kind of be stationary in winter. But all of a sudden, you can see, instead of getting two chevrons, I'm getting only one. And if I move out the city, my replenishment is so low that I don't even re don't even replenish my men. Um, so you want to kind of be in that city to, to get that. I mean, is it even worth it, though? Yeah, it probably is. Ah, screw it. Let's... Uh, yeah, let's move out because I don't want the negative public order to be hitting me much here at all. So we'll move out and just we'll get replenished when we move through the next city. Um, and that's, that's fine. And maybe we'll get some, uh, we'll get another unit slingers or something like that in the army just to fill out this, this force right now. Um, so that by moving my army out, we reduce the public order down to just minus one, which is fine. That's completely manageable, especially once a few of these buildings get built. It will help us uh, in general. And obviously it's winter as well. You've got to keep a close eye on that as well. Um, other things as well, this is a useful tab, however, it's kind of hard to use. So as you can see, every single city in Divided Impera has this screen. Unfortunately, the way the UI is set up, only two of them show because there's already a bunch of province effects. You can only have six province effects down here. I don't know why, ask Rome to developers, ask Creative Assembly. Um, so because of that, you can only see two of these cities, but this is something useful to keep an eye on and take a look at. As you can see, Rome has you know, a base government bonus right there. It produces some food, produces some growth. It gives a big tax boost as well. And then you can start to see what the city, the bottom three um, of that, so underneath tax it is, you can kind of see what the city is good at. So the city is pretty good at livestock, it's pretty good at trade, and it's really good at industry. Um, it also gives, I mean, because it's Rome, it gives a bunch of money from all sources because it's because uh, it's Rome. Not every city does do that. Um, I mean, it, this is probably a better look if we go down into Beneventium um, and we can see the cities here. I mean, why do we have like all four cities here as well? Oh, we don't. Okay, yeah, so you can see right here what the city's good at and what the city's not good at. So the city isn't very good at industry, but it's good for food and trade. Because um, you can see the bonuses it gives. And these are only minimal. These aren't going to... You don't have to specify a city just to what this tells you. But it's good to keep an eye on it. Um, because 10% of industry, that's quite a lot, you know. From free, if you're getting 300 gold, that's 30 gold less you're making. Just because of what the city is designed for. So it's a very good idea just to, you know, hover over these, see what it does. Um, and just, you know, kind of keep an eye on you know, I don't have to build, you know stuff in the city if I don't want to you know I don't have to build industry down here um, because you know it's just not necessary and that minus 10 adds up quite a lot um, up here in Beneventium you can see it, it gives some good bonuses again to uh, um, to grazing and food so you know it's already telling me that Italia is kind of more of a food region than anything else it doesn't mean I have to build it for food but it's good to keep an eye on that so this is what I was talking about because the public order has dropped I think above 25 or it has just hit 25 we're now getting this big minus uh, public order or sorry with this big tax and growth modifier which is something we want to try and get rid of as 
as quickly as possible. The main issues are just because I moved away this character and he had some really good public order bonuses. I think he gave like, yeah, plus seven public order and also foreign culture got rid of that and stuff like that. It does mean that Italia is going to be getting some big public order bonuses and having good public order stuff on this general may seem like a bit crazy, um, but it's more so just a bonus. You know, you can see at the bottom half of things, he's giving minus 12 upkeep, really good bonuses to uh, melee attack and melee defense and stuff. And the, the public order is actually pretty nice because it means when I conquer cities, they're going to be a lot less uh, a lot less rebellious. They'll be happier a lot quicker uh, by having a guy like this commanding the army. So having public order bonuses on your uh, military generals is really good. And I think for the most part, these guys will be leveling up next turn. It's always, as I said, a great idea to keep an eye on this. Uh, nothing too important at all on any of these guys. Uh, this guy, though, could probably do with some of them. Uh, no, he's already got some, so he's got public order. We don't need that. I'd much rather that on someone else. Um, and none of these else are really that good. Uh, yeah, we'll pick up this. We'll put the armor on all units. Is really good. Um, so as you can see, I still Pyrrhus moved away. I brought both my armies on the border, and we might be able to just secure Taras with uh, pretty easily. Um, also off camera as well, Carthage declared war on Syracuse. We'll have to see how that does develop uh, but for the most part we can just end the turn again and move on from there we'll level up our generals next turn and then probably spend some more money on improving room and getting that city to just be uh, an absolute money maker so it seems like i made a bit of an error the Epirus, um just came out of nowhere and absolutely demolished my army down here in the south which is actually really really bad uh, i guess that you can learn from my mistake i put my army uh, on this border right here um, not thinking that they could get over here. They did move a ridiculous amount of uh, distance, don't get me wrong, uh, to get down here. They moved from Epirus through to Taras and then over here. I was not expecting that, if I'm honest. You, even I can get surprised, even though I've played Divide and Tempera a lot. Um, but yeah, the AI managed to move a, a crazy amount of distance and caught me off guard. You know, it would have been a smarter idea to have both my armies directly together. Um, to utilize that and I could have fought that battle, but I don't think I would have won and there you go I lost a important member. Oh my god. It's, it's frustrating to to lose that because um, I don't know. I think I lost a party member um, But luckily political situation is, is fine. Who the hell did I lose? Was it my own faction? It must have been my own faction um, Maybe I just got a brand new guy out of nowhere. I Honestly don't know um, but either way, I mean, we'll just, well, yeah, whatever. Um, we can now move south, though, uh, and try and block them. I feel like this army will just come and, yeah, hit me. Man, their movement range is crazy. Absolutely crazy. Um, but either way, this army is pretty depleted, which is good. It's just this army isn't very good, so I'm, I'm pretty scared there. But that's fine. We'll move kind of, like, down south. Uh, you know, if they do try and push on our city here, we can just move to take it back. That's fine. For the most part, we do actually, we can just now upgrade these generals, which is really good. And we can start working on their important upgrades. So you definitely want to get capable bureaucrat. It doesn't give any great bonuses. It gives you a little bit of tax, but still good. And we also just all of a sudden, by getting that, we got this guy, which is absolutely amazing. Look at that. Two authority, 8% from all commerce, which is exactly what we wanted. And also the 8% tax rate as well, just by upgrading him uh, by getting the bureaucrat. That's uh, so good. Now we can decide on what we want here. Do we want a uh, you know research and empire maintenance? Don't necessarily need that right now. Uh, do we want public order and tax? It's pretty good. Or do we want to just go down the stimulus route immediately? I think you know for ourselves this early on, we've got a few public order issues. We make most of our money through tax. Let's just grab a public order. The plus three public order is nice, um, and we can always upgrade other stuff later on. That's no issue uh, whatsoever, you know. Uh, this guy leveled up as well. I'm probably just going to do very similar stuff. Um, unfortunately, he didn't pick up anyone else. Um, we have another good guy. Two pub public order right from this guy. Uh, yeah, they're, they're all pretty good. And again, we'll probably just grab up tax and public order for now. I mean, this is... I love to grab this up as quickly as possible. Because the research rate just, you know, snowballs so effectively. But again, we need public order. Um, so we will grab that up uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and our money's really good right now. We're making three grand because all of our buildings are now built. Um, so we immediately want to get down to the uh, commerce buildings. You want to just be producing commerce everywhere. Now, these will increase banditry, but not anything too crazy. Um, that's going to be done soon as well. Hmm, what do I want to build here? Do I want to build anything or do I just want to upgrade these buildings as quickly as possible? 
Probably want to get these buildings pumping out money as soon as possible. I mean, already you can see that Rome is making me four grand. That's quite a lot in the early game. And this and the province is fairly unhappy. Um, but trust me, it's only the beginning. Um, things will start to get even better. And what we could even do as well, if we wanted to at this point, is recruit a navy uh, general. We have two guys right here. One giving another boost to 11% tax. This guy, this guy is not really a governor, no. he's pretty bad. So we're going to recruit a fleet right here. Oh, we can't afford the ships. Yeah, that's fine then. We don't have to do that right away. Um, but as you can see, like now with these governors in here, we're giving public order. We're giving good bonuses to tax. Uh, if I hover over this, you can see we're getting some big uh, tax bonuses. And honestly, we could lower we could lower our, our money. We're not, we not, don't necessarily need as much money. I mean, the money is quite good. I guess we are still fighting Pyrrhus, so we don't want to be too cocky. Um, all nice and our spy and our spy leveled up as well. So we just want to stick some points into into this. This isn't really that important. Spies aren't that great at leveling up, but you can give them some good stuff uh, if you want. But for the most part, you probably want champions in your armies. Um, and again, that's all our money spent. We still have our growth point up here, but again, I'd rather have these buildings done than not. So let's end the turn once more um, as we try and outmaneuver Pyrrhus. Hopefully, we don't lose our city down to the south. Even if we do, we can always strike back with our full stack that we have coming down. So, Pyrrhus has done exactly that. He has tried to conquer the city down in the south, and this is really bad. Like, if I, if it, it all, all stemmed from my mistake um, of moving the army too close to Pyrrhus's border, um, and he did punish me. I should have waited one more turn for my army to get down here and, and conquer this. So, you guys can learn from my mistakes. The AI does have pretty crazy movement range, so they can quite easily, you know, take your cities if you're not careful. Uh, the AI did decide, decide to just loot that, though. Yeah, so say for example, if I had my army just sitting here waiting for these reinforcements to get down a couple of turns ago, Pyrrhus never would have attacked and taken the city. You know, my, I would have both armies here. So I guess that's a good lesson in not being over eager. It's just I really underestimated his movement range. So he sacked the city, which is pretty goddamn bad. Uh, also, this army does also have plagues. So we want to avoid that. Yeah, sacking the city is bad because as you can see, not only does it destroy that, it also kills a large amount of the population, which isn't great. Now, we probably want to move down and just try and engage these armies. They're depleted, fairly weakened. Uh, we've, we basically trapped Pyrrhus here now, so uh, we just want to move in. We can't go all the way, and I want to stay in range of the garrison. That's probably non-existent at this point. Uh, that's not even my garrison, right? Yeah, the garrison's pretty fucked, but either way, I basically want to block Pyrrhus's escape. Um, this is a full stack, so sure, it'll be fine against that. Um, again, just good to notice what else is going on around the world. Uh, nice. Our winery got built as well. You can already see. Look at that. Just by building that winery, we went from 3,900 to 45. Um, you know, just huge bonuses starting to pile up. It does help that it's autumn as well, uh, giving us more money from agriculture and just having that built. So all of a sudden, we're getting these huge bonuses. And as soon as we have the money, which we will next turn, we can build this wine trader. Um, again, giving us money from commerce, which again is just absolutely huge. Uh, I'm probably am going to start upgrading, so... I think what we're going to do is we're going to send you to Rome. Um, just because it's better to have you in Rome. Um, and oh my god, look at the public order bonuses. By sitting in Rome, that's huge. And I'm immediately going to pick up one an extra governor as well. We'll pick up a fleet. Um, anyone really good here? Uh, no, so we'll just grab out the guy who gave us 11% tax boost. And we're just taking one. Like, we just want him on a cheap ship. So whatever has the lowest. So it's this, this has the lowest one. And we're just going to stick him in here. And again, he's going to act as a governor, basically. So it's a good way of, of getting in more governors with your allotted amount. Because we can only have four armies and two fleets. I can use these fleets as governors as well. And they'll just help, you know, give us more money to the city. You can already see we're, we're making another 300 gold by just having that fleet guy there. He basically pays for himself. Um, yeah, he's paying for himself that 11% 11, 11 tax boost. And then he will also give us loads of money when we get him to be upgraded. And I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think they stack. So I could have a governor in every single city and they would all provide bonuses to Latium. But already, you know, on medium taxes, we're making 4,800 gold from Latium. And we're on what? What turn are we on? We are on turn seven and we're making almost five grand from Latium. Like that's an insane amount of money for turn seven to be making. Um, and we can we can invest more money. Like there's no real reason getting this harbor again gives us money from commerce. 
we desperately want more commerce. Let's grab out that. We'll get a harbor building, um, which is fine. And so you can already start to see the, the real, like, effective amount of money you can make from these cities and these provinces that have, you know, multiple resources in. Um, you know, some of the really good examples of cities like that are going to be uh, Frace, Hellas, um, uh, Pella does a pretty good job of it. Um, the... The Nile city uh, by Alexandria, the Nile province is really good for that as well. Babylon's really good. Basically, any set of cities that provide you with some, uh, some, you know, a lot of cities that have great commerce buildings. And then they also have some modifiers with the city as well, uh, which are always very useful. So you can see Pyrrhus is just defending here, which is you know, fine with me. If he wants to just fortify right now, we can basically kill him um, and, and move on with our day. Um, a few desertions because of the plague. Uh, nothing. I mean, probably just cheaper horses right now is always good. And again, look, I already like that. You, this governor's leveled up to level three, which is pretty important. Unfortunately, we can't grab this yet because he has to be level four. Um, so we can always go down a different route. Maybe something that gives us more public order or empire maintenance is always good. It's always great to check these out. I think we want to grab... Like, this is really good as well. Like, you know, plus wealth from all sources. Um, because you're gonna have multiple of these at some point in the game You're gonna have like you'll be able to fill out most of this tree as well as most of another tree So you can go like that and that's really good plus five percent tax and construction cost down from the region So again, you're gonna see we're making 4600 because it's winter. So not as much money But boom, I um, mean I sh it probably fires next turn probably that applies next turn because he is deployed um, but yeah, all of a sudden we're making a crazy amount of cash there. And now we probably want to upgrade Rome um, and start boosting more money here. Um, so something you can do later on is pick up these Italian immigrants because they're pretty effective at giving you more commerce. But you're going to have to try and match that with something else. Um, I think here, so there's multiple buildings you could grab to help boost your commerce. You could just go down more of this route and pick up like a wine trader. Uh, or something along them lines because that gives you like you definitely want a wine trader and a probably a slave trader in your cities uh, to give you more money but you could also go down this route as well and start getting the bonuses from the um from you want to get like down this eventually you definitely want this in latium at some point uh but it's going to be very late game when you get this but look at that it gives you 40 percent wealth from all commerce plus gives you more money from commercial stimulus as well like it's insane that last building and even like rank two it gives you 10 percent money from all commerce like that's crazy good. So that's what we're actually going to pick up this early on. We can always convert this when we have the tech. We don't have the tech right now for the wine trader. So yeah, grabbing that up is really, really good. Uh, so we want that as soon as possible if we can help it. Latim is now getting happier. So hopefully we'll get rid of this troubled populace soon. And we'll just keep on going. I wonder if we could defeat these guys in battle. I guess there's no real reason to go after them. I'm actually going to retreat. Oh yeah, it's a slaughter. Perfect. So yeah, they're, they're obviously definitely, we definitely want to take a, uh, a protective probably. Won't kill as many, but we've trapped them anyway. So now here's an interesting thing. What do we do right here? Do we release the captives? Uh, it'll make Carthage not like us because we've released them. Um, do we enslave them and just get the public order hit to the surrounding city? Or do we just kill them and make Carthage like us a bit more? I mean, realistically, I'm fine with going to war with Carthage early if they want it. I'm just going to enslave them. It's going to create a few more negative bonuses, like, you know, to public order and stuff, because it's going to increase slave. But it's going to give us more money in the, you know, you can see like that. Latium just got a big influx of money uh, right now. Oh, we also definitely want to build that up as well. I'll come and kill this army as well. Uh, so, Pyrrhus, it was nice knowing you, but you have been slain. And we'll enslave him again. And then we'll just march on their city, right? We'll march on uh, Taris, try and claim that back. Um, nice thing is the army leveled up. Now there's a lot of good things here. I generally pick up the Veteran Legion because it doesn't have any negatives and it's also just great. Anything that gives me campaign movement is amazing. And then, you know, anything else, you can kind of just look at them, see what you want your army to be specialized in. Um, and all of it is pretty good. I, I generally pick this up because it gives you a bit more armor and melee defense, so it's, it's always nice to have. And we can just march on that. Um, obviously, upgrading uh, the Proven Leader is, is really important. 
Um, and then you kind of have a choice. What, what else do you want to do? I like to go Fearless Warrior. Is, is always nice as well. Um, but also Skilled Tactician is also great. You get some crazy good bonuses in Skilled Tactician. Um, and you also like... Um, something else, a really good tip is don't feel like you only have to put one point into these starting skills. If you put two points into these starting skills, they give you an upgraded ability. So if I was to take Fearless Warrior, um, no, sorry, if I was to take Fearless Warrior to level two, it'd give me Warcry. Um, if I was to upgrade this to rank two, it'd give me Second Wind. So upgrading these first abilities to rank two is also really, really good. This gives me Battle Rhythm, which is great as well. So upgrading these top stats are really good. Besides the commerce one, I don't think that gives you anything. Uh, this gives you raised banners, which is nice. Uh, we'll just pick up Fearless Warrior. And again, it's always a good idea to keep on, see what he's taking up. Anything else really important here? Uh, well, that gives me plus two authority when leading an army. And I'll boost him to 11 authority, which will give him a huge influence. So we'll grab that for sure. Um, and everything else is fine. We can check no one's leveled up. We're making a ton of money from Latium already. A bunch of upgrades already going off. Look at that. Like, Latium is going to be pumping out cash soon. Okay, so I just took Taris to finish off Epirus. They obviously still have a, you know, their, their city in Apollonia. And now the question is, do we want to move over and take Apollonia? I don't think so. Um, generally, I wouldn't suggest taking places in Hellas right away. There's a lot more issues. Obviously, Carthage taking land in Sicily is going to be more of something you have to take an eye on. So generally, if you've defeated uh, a faction's armies, they'll be less likely. They'll be a lot more likely even to make peace with you um, because they don't have any armies now. Um, I've just taken their city. But you know, they they want to they want to make peace now because they know that I have the huge advantage. Let's just get a little bit of money from them. Uh, and we'll secure peace with them. That's like good. Yeah, again, that will annoy Carthage, but I've kind of made my bet at this point. I kind of know that I'm going to be fighting Carthage probably next. I've allied, oh, I've, I've non-aggression with the barbarian tribes. I've made peace in uh, in Epirus. Um, and now I can take some time. It's always pretty important in your campaigns to take some time uh, once you've conquered like a new region, you've just ended some war, to, to regain your population, to focus on infrastructure and building up your cities. So again, I can move him outside the city just to help this region get happier. I've destroyed some of these buildings because I don't really want... Uh, I guess we could do that. Having a, a level 2 harbour isn't bad. It's a level 3 one, which is bad. Uh, I'm going to be destroying a lot of these buildings and kind of revamping Italia now to start producing me a lot of food. Uh, because as you can see, I think even Taris is pretty good for food. Uh, if we can find it. Again, it doesn't. It's so annoying. I don't know why they do this in Rome. Like you can only have six of them there, so you can't actually see Taris. But I'm pretty sure uh, most of my cities here are fairly good for food. So yeah, you know, this will be my bread basket of uh, of the campaign, and kind of you know, I'll concentrate a fair amount of food right there. In Rome, you can see it's getting upgraded. So now I think that's basically everything you guys need to know. I'm gonna play like five or six turns to show you how ridiculous Latium can get. Um, once you upgrade it a bit more. So I'm going to lower taxes for now. Because um, again, I want to boot... Like, look at that. We're making 4,800 gold a turn with a full stack. And, you know, just two provinces. Um, because of the bonuses we're getting and the way we're building Latium. Um, you know, to, to really come in. And that's not even with all these buildings upgraded as well. So I'm just going to play like 10 turns. Uh, make sure I can get Latium really, really happy. Um, and then probably upgrade Rome once as well. And then I'll just show you how ridiculous it can get and how quickly you can make it happen. Okay, so we can end things off here. I just wanted to quickly show you guys the crazy amount of money that we are now making. So we are... Let's have a look. We're 17 turns into the game. And we are making... 1300 gold we are on normal taxes but we could quite easily go down to that and still make 10 grand uh, a turn which is absolutely insane we have a full army levied obviously i'd probably generally have a at this point a better army than this and also probably another army as well like two stacks but even with that we'd still be making a healthy amount of cash and as you can see latium is now making us 11 and a half grand actually i i did this a bit too early all of this stuff needs to be built so let's end the turn once more but you can already see 17 turns in and latium is making us a ridiculous amount of money and as i said you can do this with basically any province that has four cities and like three to two resources that you can make into commerce you can really push it latium's a great like probably one of the better ones uh next to Thrace, just because it's rome and rome is just op 
But just in general, you can really see, like, you know, Latium is going to basically fund every war I have for the next, you know, the entire game, basically. If I just keep on upgrading them, keep on leveling up the generals, keep upgrading, you know, making sure I have enough food to support the city, but upgrading or getting the tech required to upgrade all the resource buildings, you know, you can just push this city and you can quite easily make 50, 60, 70 grand from an individual city as you get further on and you get better research and more generals and stuff. Like, you can really push it. Um, and obviously, as well as that. So basically, with all of that done now, we're, what, making 12 grand. 12,000, basically 13 grand from that. And as I said, like, these guys are fairly low level. You know, these are all level 3 um, generals. So these guys are only going to get stronger and provide me with more bonuses. I've got a nice little uh, ancillary right here, which is really helping out. Over on this guy, I've also got similar ancillaries as well, which is going to be giving us loads of money. On our fleet as well, you know, we have another ancillary. And this guy's only level one as well. So, again, we can only, you know, you can just you can just see, like, if I was to build another fleet over here, maybe get another general or something over there. Obviously, you know, there's, like, capital game, like games where it starts to, like, you know, erode at your, uh, your you know, bonuses. But still, like... You know, you can just see the, the pure strength of doing this and focusing on commerce. And hopefully this has really helped uh, those of you who have maybe struggled to make money in Divided Tempera. Um, especially when you start growing and you get big empire maintenance and stuff like that. But, but by upgrading your generals um, and leveling up this, you'll end up actually getting less empire maintenance. So it's basically corruption in the other games. Uh, so, you know, as you go bigger, as long as you're getting this, you'll actually not have to suffer too much with empire maintenance whatsoever. Um, but yeah, hopefully this has helped a bunch of you guys as you started out. It was a fairly long video, but I feel like this is just the easiest way for me to show you guys what you should be doing uh, in Divided Empire and what you shouldn't be doing and obviously you know look how much money we're making and we could quite easily go on the lowest taxes and just run away commercial stimulus is giving us 31 percent boost to all commerce this is giving us 10 percent um and you know right now obviously our goal is to to get this building because then we can you know maybe change this into a wine trader which will give us even more money that's 300 percent uh, 300 wealth from commerce plus everything else plus the other five percent from all commerce and five for trade and you can just see where it starts to get kind of crazy you know now food will start to become a small issue in this province because i'm focusing it so heavily elsewhere but that's why having a building like this and upgrading it uh will you know give you a load of food and help you out and obviously as you upgrade this it's these trade ports start to eat away at your food and this starts to eat away at your food and stuff so you know it's good to obviously on your next couple upgrades when you get these is to build some food or something just to help out the city itself but you, you can also just go hard on food over here you can see i'm building you know more of this down here to the south um so yeah you can kind of just see a, a good way of doing it but yeah hopefully you found this useful drop a like and a comment if you did and i'll see you guys in the next one